Welcome to Pirate Living Podcast. We're your hosts, Karan and Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> On this podcast, we are highlighting ordinary people living extraordinary lives. These are pirates who take small, bold actions daily to create social change. Pirate life is all about rebelling and breaking the rules for good. Creating lasting social change starts by first breaking our inner rules. After all, the hardest rules to break are your own. The pirates we highlight have dedicated themselves to creating good trouble. Today we are talking with Daryl Stickle, leading expert on trust. He has worked with senior executives from a broad range of industries from all over the world. He has served as faculty for the Luxembourg School of Business and the Center for Effective Organizations at the University of South Carolina. And he recently completed the book, Building Trust, Exceptional Leadership in an Uncertain World. Daryl teaches leaders how to find and use their most powerful tool, how to effectively build trust in their relationships. He is an unshakable force of positivity and brings out the best in people, and his personal trials have strengthened his resolve and character to be a positive force for trust. He believes in a bright future and our ability to build it together. And Daryl, welcome. We're so happy to have you with us today. It's awesome to be here with you and, and with the dogs. Yeah, we told you <laughs> they'd probably speak up. <laughs> he's, he's bare starting early. Nice. <laughs> So, yeah, and we also gave you a heads up beforehand that we've let Google AI write a poem for you. So would you like to hear what Google created? I'd love to hear what Google has to say about <laughs> me. So, Daryl Stickle, a man of trust, he builds it up and he never busts. He works with executives from all different industries. He teaches at universities and writes books about trust. He's a social rebel. He breaks the rules for good. He asks uncomfortable questions and takes small, bold actions. He believes in good trouble and he's living proof. He's a true inspiration to everyone he meets. He's changing the world one person at a time. So thank you, Daryl Stickle, for all that you do. You're making a difference and it's truly appreciated. Well, thank you, Google. <laughs> yeah. That could have been worse. <laughs> Google's was, getting better at this. It, it is. And it actually had some rhyme. It, it did rhyme trust with trust, but still. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so, yeah, we love to get started um, by letting you like lead us on what we like to call your pirate journey, your tale of what right. brought you down this path um, of you yeah, working with people and helping them to build trust. What started you on your journey? You know, it, it's a good question. And there's this saying, I think it's by Kierkegaard, that life makes sense in reverse, but we live it forward. And and so I was really struck when I started working on my book about how the story of how I got here seemed to make sense in retrospect. Um, I was born and raised in Fort St. John, a small town in northeastern British Columbia. And it was fairly isolated. Uh, winters were pretty harsh. And so there was a sense of community. People had to pull together. And I learned there that if you could help someone, you should. And so, you know, a good foundation for somebody to have awareness and empathy about others and their struggles. Um now, when I was 17, I was playing hockey. I was playing junior hockey, and we went to Fort Nelson to play in a tournament. And partway through our last game, I was attacked by a fan with a club. Um, shattered my helmet, knocked me unconscious. Uh, then a player grabbed me and, and beat the living tar out of me. Um, and I ended up with a really severe concussion. And... I knew at that age that I was going blind, that I was going to lose my sight. Um, not completely, so I'm, I'm legally blind now, but I knew that I would probably have to think for a living. You know, jobs that required me to see things or see small detail were not going to be an option for me. And now here I am, I, you know, I've got the attention span of a fruit fly. And I just can't. I can't manage. I went from being on the honor roll to failing everything. And it provoked a, a profound understanding in me of loss 
and feeling helpless and feeling hopeless. And so I, I struggled to get back on my feet. It took a couple of years for things to kind of return to some sense of normal. Um, and I found myself at the university of Victoria and I'd be on the bus and somebody would just sit down next to me and say, I'm really having a hard time. And so for some reason, complete strangers would just completely open up to me. And I, I wanted to understand what was driving that. Um, and I also thought if this is going to keep happening, maybe I should get paid for this. <laughs> um, so I started down a path towards clinical psychology and I started working with families in crisis and troubled teens and working on crisis lines and, and street kids and all those kinds of things to hone those skills and to better understand them and to be the strongest candidate I could for a, a clinical psychology program. And I got partway through that and I realized that a lot of the folks I was working with were just doing the best they could. And, and that even if you could point out a path for them to move forward and, and do better, they couldn't take it. And I thought this will drive me insane. And so I shifted and went into public administration uh, and British Columbia is one of the last places dealing with native land claims. Um, and so I was working first for the provincial government and then the federal government in native land claims. And they would ask me these deep philosophical questions like, what is self-government? Or what will the province look like 50 years after claims are settled? The last question they asked me was, how do we convince a group of people who shafted for over 100 years they should trust us? And I thought, man, that is a good question. Um, so I, I went to Duke and wrote my doctoral thesis on building trust in hostile environments. Yeah, that, that really is a tall order. <laughs> that's, that's no small ask. Um, uh, I'd love to know even just specifically in that example, what kind of things did you do to build trust? So in large part, the natives were giving us hints all along. They were saying, you know, you, you show up, you negotiate, you never sit down with us. You never have a conversation with us. You never get to know us. Hmm. And part of the challenge is we come in with so many assumptions into relationships and we often don't include the other person in the conversation. And you know, one of the mantras that I tend to use when I'm teaching people about building trust is to ask first, ask, listen, then respond. And so it's a, it's a bit of a coach approach where I give people the advice to actually include others in the conversation. So you get a sense of what they need, what they want, what good looks like for them, what their goals and objectives are, so that you can actually tailor your approach to meet their needs. Mm -hmm. And so often we find ourselves, you know, assuming what someone's best interests are. Um, one of the, <clears throat> I talk about different levers that we can pull to build trust. And one of our favorite levers is, is the ability lever. I've got these kinds of credentials, this sort of background, this much experience. And we pull that a lot, but rarely do we actually define it with other folks. So before we started, I said, I want to be one of the better guests that you've had. What does that look like? And so I invited you to help me define what good looked like. And we rarely do that. We come in with our own mindset of what good looks like and we don't include the other party. Yeah, I think you're definitely one yeah. of the first people to ask us that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's funny, too, how, like you said, we as people tend to come in with the assumption, the assumption largely that everybody's just like us. And if they're not just like us, then there's something wrong that needs to be fixed. And so we, as in general, um, tend to go into situations meeting people thinking this person's I, I can understand because they're like me and forgetting they're not. And so bringing that assumption in is what leads to a lot of the not listening. So yeah, um, taking it back to the listening and letting the other person tell you, no, this is who I am. Um, it's amazing <laughs> how much <laughs> difference that can make. 
Well, and we all have our own stories about things mm -hmm. too, right? So like we're putting our own stories onto other people and assuming that they carry the same story about whatever it is you're, you're talking about when like you should work on your own story first before you put right. it on someone else. So true. And we, because we interpret the world through stories, we can have dramatically different perceptions of the exact mm -hmm. same event. And that can lead to some really profound misperceptions um, and miscommunications. So, you know, and, and like you said, it, it, it's not a small task. Like when I first got to Duke, I was, I was fortunate that someone else had just arrived. who was one of the considered one of the world's leading experts on the topic academically. And the year after I showed up, <clears throat> a woman named Karen Cook showed up who was another leading academic on the topic. And so I ended up with two of the world's leading theoretical folks on the topic of trust on my committee. Um, when I, when I finished, they sat me down and they said, okay, when you first came to us with this and said, this is my thesis topic, we said, we, we had a conversation with each other and we said, too big, too complicated. He never solves it. We'll give him six months. He'll come crawling back to us. We'll let him chisel off a little piece of this and that'll be his thesis. I said, six months in, you're so far beyond us. We couldn't help anymore. All we could do is sit and watch. And now we think you've solved it. And so you know, again, it just felt like there was an intentionality aligning up around the right people being in the right place at the right time. Um, me having the right guidance and, and exposure, the right set of experiences to have insights that hadn't been really present before. Well, I like that because yeah, it was just our last guest had a very similar situation where it was just being in the right place, the right time with the right people that kind of uh, step into your life to, to guide, guide you in the direction that you were meant to be in, which, which is, which is amazing when you think about how many little things had to come together to kind of make something happen. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The lessons you learn from life, right? Sometimes a hard road's a good teacher mm -hmm. and it's a question of, do we pick up those lessons or not? Um, do we learn from it? Does it make us stronger? Yeah, and with your story too, like leading back to Trusk, um, after you got hit by the fan and then beaten by a another player, like I imagine there was a lot of trust rebuilding that had to happen there as well. Do you, yeah, would you be willing to share a little bit more about like how you rebuilt trust as you were healing and also realizing I am not going to be able to see the way that I once saw before? Right. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because, again, we have a choice about how we interpret things, what things we attend to, what we focus on. Um. The team that I was on was a juvenile team. So we were 17 and 18 year olds and we were playing in a junior B tournament, which was up to 21 year olds. And the other team had more players than we did uh, because we were traveling to Fort Nelson. We were playing the home team. Um, when I got pulled into the stands, my teammates cleared the bench and there was a huge brawl that took place. Um, now the game was televised, so I got to watch it afterwards and people were throwing beer bottles at me as they were carrying me off the ice and my team went into the stands um and the level of support and camaraderie and protection that i received from those on my team uh was truly inspiring and it just felt so true to the values that I had, which was that the strong should protect the weak and that each of us has the potential to be weak at any given moment and that we need to look out for each other. It's a big, tough, nasty world at times. And we all need support and help. And there are ways that I can be strong for others now um, that I couldn't in that moment. And so 
that was the lesson I took from that. And the, you know, the struggles that I had afterwards, I think the people who struggled most with it were my father and my older brother because they loved me and they were protective and something had happened and they didn't have any control over it and they hadn't been there when it happened and they didn't know how to fix it and they just wanted me to be better. And that manifested as them being frustrated, telling me to just pull it together, just because we didn't know a lot about concussions. Hmm. It was in the mid eighties and they just wanted me to be better for it not to be serious. And it was, and they struggled with that. Um, and so, you know, the, the profound challenge is the loss of sense of self, you know, that, that feeling like there were things that made me special or capable or, uh, that, that I was going to be able to provide for myself in the future. And that was all in doubt. Um, and, you know, I, I had it revisited on me and, you know, in 2001, I was on the way to a client site. I was working for McKinsey and company, big management consulting firm. And the cab I was in rear-ended someone else. I ended up with another concussion and it just, some of the symptoms just never went away. Um, and that struggle to accept yourself. Um, we have this heightened notion of who we were before the injury, this glorified notion of who we were and this potentially negative diminishing notion of who we are now. And so it exaggerates that gap. And there's a long battle to struggle with feeling comfortable in our own skin, feeling confident, feeling like we're bringing something of meaning or power to the world. And sometimes we don't make it. Um, I've been blessed. You know, I've got two sons that are the center of my world. Um, I have a positive impact in the world. I'm working hard to try to make the world a better place. And I see that impact on a regular basis. So, you know, it's been a long, challenging journey, but I'm kind of glad at the place that I've ended up. And what, what are you doing now with us, with this work? So I, uh, do coaching. I work with organizations. I've worked with families. There's a lot of people talking about the fact that trust is at the lowest levels we've ever seen, mm -hmm. but I am really focused on helping people better understand not just what trust is, but what to do about it. And so I help individuals and organizations better understand how trust works and the steps that they can take to make things better. And so uh, I have this practical applied approach that I use in my coaching, in the courses that I teach, in the masterclass, in the book that I wrote. It's all intended to scale this concept so that people can understand the model that I use and apply it and make their lives better. So I've worked with nonprofits. I worked with the Canadian military, trying to help them figure out how to build trust with the locals in Afghanistan. Um, I've worked with private sector, public sector, families, couples, all across the gamut. And the model holds, you know, I've worked with companies from all over the world. Um, and so I have this, I've spent the last 20 years of my life focused on applying these concepts and helping people learn them. And it's a continual learning experience for me as well. What are some of those key, key points within the model without like giving away the whole thing that you teach, but <laughs> like, no, I, yeah. I'm happy to share it. Yeah. What are some of those key points? So the definition for trust is that it's a willingness to be vulnerable when you can't completely predict how someone else is going to behave. So there's elements of uncertainty and vulnerability in that definition. And so when we decide to trust someone, we ask ourselves two fundamental questions. The first one's how likely am I to be harmed, which is perceived uncertainty. 
The second question is, if I'm harmed, how bad's it going to hurt? And so if we think about the level of uncertainty and multiply it by the level of vulnerability, we get a level of perceived risk. And we each have a threshold of risk that we're comfortable with. If we go beyond that threshold, we don't trust. If we're beneath it, then we do. And so building trust is a matter of understanding where does uncertainty come from and how do we take steps to reduce it? Where does vulnerability come from and how do we take steps to manage that? And so early in relationships, we've got a high level of uncertainty. That means we can only tolerate a small range of vulnerability to still fit beneath that threshold. As that relationship gets deeper, the uncertainty starts to drop and the range of vulnerability we can tolerate starts to grow. And so in really deep relationships, there's just a sliver of uncertainty. We're, we're really confident about that other person. And so there's a huge range of vulnerability that we can tolerate. The challenge that we see in the world today is that vulnerability certainly hasn't gone down, but uncertainty is bouncing all over the place. Mm. feels like the rules are changing. Um, you know, we went through COVID, the pandemic, and, and we, we saw different rules in different places, and those rules seem to change fairly often. Um, we see race relations and gender relations and relations between political ide ideologies and nations are all in flux. Mm -hmm. And we've got changing norms and values, which there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but it does create uncertainty for us about how we behave and what normal or good looks like. And so it provokes a real challenge for us when we're trying to think about accepting additional vulnerability from someone else, making ourselves a little more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so we've got this sort of uncertainty times vulnerability equals risk and that comparison. That's the trust decision. And then after that decision, we have perceived outcomes. And so because we interpret the world through stories, it's possible for us to have the same experience, but have a different narrative about what happened. So there's another place there where we can intervene. We can, you know, we can start by saying, what's a good outcome look like? We can get a shared sense of what that looks like before we get there so that we can then have the same narrative or hopefully have a, a narrative that we've created together about whether it was a good outcome or not, who gets the credit, who gets the blame. But in the middle of all this is our emotional states, whether we like or dislike somebody else. 99% of the trust research treats people like rational actors. And I don't know if you folks have met people before, but we're, we're not always rational. No. <laughs> no, and and the more extreme our emotional states become, the less rational we are. And so a lot of times in these hostile environments, in these difficult disputes, we're seeing people bring cognitive, rational arguments to a profoundly emotional issue. And we don't get a lot of traction. So for me, there are 10 levers. And if I went through and I sort of said, where does uncertainty come from? Well, it comes from us as individuals, and it comes from the context that we're embedded in. And so, you know, context ends up being really powerful early in the relationship. We think about settings where we trust people without knowing anything about them. You know, we go to a restaurant, we get in a cab, we, we get on a plane. We, we believe the pilots made it through all 12 steps of that substance abuse program. You know, one of the examples I use is you go to a doctor's office and the doctor says, take off your clothes. And, and you do, Right. I've tried that in other places. It doesn't work. <laughs> you know, I'll be standing at the Starbucks and they'll say, hey, I'm a doctor. Um, you know, response is usually not positive. So, so we see the context having a huge impact on our decisions to trust others. From the individual perspective, it's benevolence, integrity, and ability are the three levers that we can pull. Benevolence is, do you have my best interest at heart? And will you act in my best interest? even if it's not in your own short-term best interest. Mm -hmm. Integrity is, do I follow through on my commitments and do my actions line up with the values that I express? And then abilities, do I have the competence to do what I say I'm going to do? And we talked about the competence lever before, right? It's one of the 10 levers we can pull. And, and we all have the ability to build trust. 
Some are just better than others. So those who aren't very good have a lever that they pull and they pull it over and over again and hope that it works. Those who are better have multiple levers. Those who are really good have multiple levers and they know when to pull which one. Mm -hmm. And so what I do is I teach people what the levers are and I talk them through how to pull them. Sorry, that was long. <laughs> that was good. I just it brings up when I was working, I've worked several different corporate jobs, but like as I think about that too, like um being in the corporate job and feeling a lot of uncertainty because I was never knew when I was gonna go home that day because I was working in childcare. It's like, are the parents gonna pick up their kids on time? Are all the teachers gonna show up? There was a lot of uncertainty, but my, in particular, my boss, I had most of the time I was there, didn't really know how to handle all of us having our emotions of being like, I want to go home. I want to have some certainty within this job. So she, yeah, she'd usually get frustrated with us a lot. And there was lack of trust that we had with her to see our best interests. So, mm -hmm. um, when in that too, like, Watching that and then trying to learn from her too, like how can I better lead as a lower member in management, but still just doing it from example and not and like, okay, I can listen to people now, what do I do? So as I'm listening to you talk about the levers of trust, it makes so much sense too, and why so many people rising into leadership who aren't being given this tool um, end up ultimately just struggling as a leader. Yeah, there's a profound challenge for leaders right now. Um, it may be one of the hardest times it's ever been to be a leader. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is that trust levels are remarkably low. And as a leader, the more senior you become, the less direct control you have over outcomes. The more dependent you are on everybody else to get the things done that you want done. Now, all your goals and objectives are realized through somebody else's work. And so you, you actually, you know, the research tells us that higher trust levels within a team lead to higher performance, higher engagement, higher employee satisfaction, higher profit margins, higher efficiency. Like there's just so many good things that happen. So you want your teams to have high trust levels. Well, that means that they have to be willing to be vulnerable. And they're not, you know, because of that uncertainty that we're seeing. And so for leaders, they have to actually go first. And it's something that leaders are really struggling with right now. You know, a lot of times when you step into a leadership position, you have to let go of the things that you were really good at and step into new roles and responsibilities. And, and every time you do that, you're going to make mistakes because we learn by doing and we don't do it perfect the first time. And so leaders need to lead with their imperfections. They need to be okay with making mistakes and they need to be okay with those that they lead making mistakes, creating an environment where that's okay. Mm -hmm. So if they want high trust in their teams, they have to go first. I found one of the things, sorry, back when I was like in the corporate world as well, one of the biggest like kind of breakers of trust that the right <laughs> sure <laughs> sure um was i find uh, a lot of leaders or even people in general um just don't stay true to their word um integrity violations and, so integrity so just i found just like by doing what i say i'm going to do um is a huge builder of trust when oftentimes it's just really rare for people to actually do it right and there's there's some challenges when it comes to integrity, particularly now that things are changing so fast. Mm -hmm. It becomes harder and harder to make promises that we can follow through on down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and I encourage people to make promises about effort, not outcome. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times we don't have control over the outcomes, mm -hmm. right? And we have this tendency to overpromise, particularly when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, who of us have not laid with our head against the cool porcelain altar, <laughs> swearing to God we'll never drink again? You know, even in that moment, you know you're lying. Mm -hmm. And and so 
with my sons, I try to really make an effort to say, this is what I will attempt to do. These are the steps that I will take. I can't guarantee the outcomes, but here's what I'm going to do. And there's a, a couple of places we fall down. One is people interpret the world through stories. Well, if we're not helping in the creation of that story, every time we make a, a decision, there's the chance that half the organization is going to think we're not in alignment with the values that we've expressed. How does that line up? You know, there's a a telecom company in Canada that's tagline was the future's friendly. Well, I was sitting with a bunch of senior executives and I said, what does that mean? And they said, well, we didn't think there's going to be a quiz. And these are all vice presidents. And they just all looked at each other and said, we're, we're actually not quite sure. I said, what promises are you making to people that you are failing to deliver against? Because the thing I take away from that is the future is going to be friendly. It's the present you have to worry about. <laughs> and And so, you know, we need to take care that everyone understands what the commitment is, what the promise is. And then we need to be transparent once we followed through on it. You remember when I told you this is what I was going to do? This is me doing it. And, you know, I think that's particularly true for parenting. Um, you know, my, my sons are now 22 and 19, but th they're the center of my world. They mean more to me than anything. And they know that if I make a commitment, I'm going to follow through and they know what my values are. And I'm consistent about showing up that way. And I tell them, you know, this is my story of you. I have a relentlessly positive story of my sons, which means that I interpret new information about them through a positive lens. And I have an incredible relationship with the two of them. Um, you know, they tell me things that I never would have told my parents. Like there are moments where they'll be telling me something. I'll start looking around going like, your dad might hear this. Oh, <laughs> oh that's me. <laughs> so yeah, the, the integrity one is a challenge. Part of what I su suggest to people is we pull the integrity lever by being really clear and transparent, trying to create a pattern of behavior that we can predict. So that we say, I will reach out to you within a week. Um, you remember when I told you I was going to reach out to you within a week? This is me following up on that. Um, and and so trying to create a pattern of behavior that's consistent and predictable reduces uncertainty. Yeah, as you were talking about leadership, I was thinking that sounds a, a lot like as well, like how a relationship, a parent-child relationship goes. Or I taught for years. Um and I was remembering too, picture day was one of those days where it was like, I cannot promise you when we're going to have our picture taken, especially because they were the old, my class was the oldest one in the ditch center. So we were last because they were supposed to have the most control. <laughs> and um, I, we'd be there. I'm like, I, I don't know when we're going to have our picture taken and their behavior like escalated and I'm the and I'm also trying to keep them nice looking in their picture day clothes like not too dirty or anything like that right and so the more uncertain like I was and the less I could give to them um even as like here I we're gonna do these things and then we'll go get our picture taken it was because of that uncertainty that they just like were like woohoo we cannot control ourselves today and so but on the times when I could tell them, like, this is what's happening, this is when it's going to happen, this is what we can look forward to, it was a lot different of a response. They were a lot more yeah. calm. So, yeah, it's, and then, I mean, as adults, we're still basically a lot like what we were as kids, where it's like, we Absolutely. want somebody to tell us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I used to work in group homes and receiving mm -hmm. homes, and it was really about being consistent. It was about being so predictable. And if I said something was going to happen, it had to happen. Um, you know, I worked at a drop-in center for street kids and they just, they craved that consistency. Um, a colleague of mine once said that children are like the night watchman. They check every door praying to God that it's locked because that means it's safe. 
but they test constantly. And they need to know that those boundaries are there. You know, I get dropped into a family and it's, I quickly see that the children were just running amok, right? Like they were, they were the ones running the household. And I would say, your kids are going to hate me for the first two weeks. Then they're going to love me. And that was how it happened every time because it was test, 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 test. I hate this guy. I hate this guy. He's, he's constantly telling me what the rules are and then telling me what the consequences are going to be. And I break the rule and there's a consequence. That doesn't seem fair. And then they get used to it and they kind of go, okay, I'm safe with this guy because I know what the rules are Mm -hmm. and he's not going to randomly blow up on me. And even when I break the rule, he's just going to be really calm and say, okay, so I told you what the consequences are. Here they are. And they came to rely on that and they, they needed it. Right? They needed someone to provide them with consistency and constance. And so you're right, absolutely. Reducing that uncertainty um, is so soothing for all of us. And it's become more challenging because what excellence looks like has become a moving target. Hmm. And integrity gets a little harder when we can't predict things and how they're going to change. But the benevolence lever is probably my favorite lever. It's how do we look out for one another? How do we care for one another? And, you know, I'll I'll be working with families and I'll say to the parents, who here has their kid's best interest at heart? You know, all the hands go up. And I'll say, great. How many of your kids would say that? And it's about a third. And it's somewhat hesitant. Mm -hmm. And part of the challenge there is that we don't include them in the conversation. Right, We assume what their best interests are. And as parents, we're thinking about today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, 10 years down the road. We don't hold ourselves to that standard. I'm not engaged in behaviors right now that are going to help me 10 years from now. In fact, probably the opposite. And we're thinking about this sort of extended time frame for our kids, and they're thinking about right now. And so... We actually need to include them in the conversation. And that's not just for our kids. It's for anyone that we're working with. You know, one of the things that I give to people as an exercise, and this is something your listeners can do tomorrow, you know, right after they hear this podcast, pick someone you want to practice with. Say, I heard this Yahoo Daryl talking about trust. And he said benevolence was really important. And that means acting in someone's best interest looking out for somebody. And I think I do that, but it doesn't always seem to land that way. Have you ever experienced that or seen it? And people are going to go, oh yeah, absolutely. Well, what did you, what did you try? What did you? And so you start to share stories about times when you've been misunderstood when you're trying to act in someone's best interest. Then you narrow the funnel a bit and you say, have you ever had somebody really have your back? Like really know they had your best interest at heart? And They'll say, yeah, and they'll start, well, what did they do? What did it look like? How did it feel? And so now we're getting hints about what benevolence looks like for them. Then we narrow the funnel even further. And we say, what does success look like for you? How do I help you get there? What would it look like if I was benevolent to you? Now we've created a shared understanding of what benevolence is for them. And we can be transparent moving forward when we say, You remember when you told me this is what good looked like for you? This is me trying to help you get there. Remember when you told me success was getting a promotion? This is how you get there. That means I'm going to have to hold you to a higher standard. That means I'm going to have to spotlight you more. You're going to have to take on more responsibility. And I'm going to give you feedback based on the next role, not this one. And that starts to feel like benevolence instead of picking on somebody. They interpret it differently. They give us the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Yeah, I think that having that conversation also makes it a little easier because there's, I know there's been times where someone thinks they know best for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and sometimes that, that can be interpreted much differently. And like you said, that it feels more like they're picking on you or, um, you know, that they don't have your best interests, that they're 
they're just doing these things. Um, so having that conversation is a huge part of it. Cause I feel like sometimes people act in the, your best interest and, uh, you don't know it. <laughs> right. Or you don't feel it. Doesn't right? feel it. Yeah. Yeah. I had that experience when I was trying to help another blind guy and, and he was trying to get somewhere and I was like, maybe it's over this way. And I was not helping. Right. Like I was trying to help, <laughs> but I was not helping. And he was like, stop helping me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, we, we both needed assistance from someone else, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it was, it was literally the blind leading the blind. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> yes, it was. Fair. Okay. And, and, you know, I've got my seeing eye dog, Drake. If he could have put his paws over his eyes, he would have done it. <laughs> right? He's just been like, oh, my God. But, uh, yeah. And it's one of the challenges we face, right? Asking for help is one of the ways that we show trust. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times when I'm working with executives, it's it's about this lack of awareness about what trust is and who they trust and how much they trust them. And, you know, I'll ask people, who do you trust? And I get these close, tight personal relationships, you know, best friend, sibling, spouse. Um, and then I'll flip the question and I'll say, who trusts you? Mm -hmm. And you get this long pause and then people will say, well, how would I know? How do I know if someone trusts me or not? And the answer comes from the definition. The definition was the trust is a willingness to be vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? When you can't completely predict how someone's going to behave. Well, how, how can these people be vulnerable to you? And then are they? So if I'm a leader, do people tell me what their real development needs are? Mm -hmm. Are they open and honest with feedback? Do they push back against things they don't think will work? Do they try new things? Are they willing to make mistakes and own up to it? Do I, do I get the bad news first or last? And these are all ways that we can understand if people trust us or not, because those are all ways they can make themselves vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And asking for help is a big one. Mm -hmm. Part of the challenge that we see with leaders is, you know, the, the, and parents, we want to be perfect, right? We, we struggle to admit that we've made a mistake or that we've failed or, and that's such a powerful learning moment for, you know, with, for our kids or for those we lead, you know, for my sons, I make mistakes. I have flaws. I, I mean, you'd have to check out my ex-wife's blog for a complete list, but, <laughs> um, but I have many flaws. And when I make a mistake, I will say to them, I didn't handle that the way I wanted to. I could have done better. <laughs> and they'll go, yeah you know, like I was part of that and they'll try to excuse it for me. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, yeah, no, I think, I think if I had it to do over again, I would try it this way. Um, and they've seen me sort of feel like I didn't do as well as I could have there. And they've seen me role model that for them. So the, they know it's okay to make mistakes and to try to learn from them instead of trying to pretend like nothing ever happened. Just to rewind a little bit, I want to go back to your director of goodness. Great, the DOG. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell us, uh, tell us about him. So, uh, Drake is so amazing. Um, he's changed my life. Uh, I've had Drake for six years now. He's he's eight years old. Uh, he was trained by the BC Alberta Guide Dogs Association. Um. I can see clearly for about six inches. And then after that, everything becomes very blurry. And so I could navigate the world. Sometimes I'd use a cane and sometimes I wouldn't. Um, but it was slow and people didn't know. Right. And, and so I couldn't see people's faces. I couldn't see their body language. It was very easy for me to be very alone in a crowd. Um, and Drake changed all of that because now people can tell, oh, he's visually impaired and he is so affectionate. He has such a positive story about the entire world. And, you know, if I've stopped somewhere, I will let people 
pet him and hang out with him because he loves people, you know, and they assume it's just about treats, but it isn't. He just has such a warm spot in his heart for people. He just wants to say hi. Um, and so we were actually, we were sitting in the Denver airport and waiting for our flight. And we're kind of just sitting in this line of seats and this huge black guy comes up, sits down next to me and says, can I just say hi to your dog? <laughs> and I said, yeah, of course. And we have this great conversation and he's, you know, Drake's giving him all kinds of love and he's responding and, um, his fiance comes up and says, look, we got to get to our next flight. And he says, I'm talking with Drake. <laughs> and so the, the two of them hang out. We have this wonderful interaction. And then this, he gets up and leaves. The seat doesn't have a chance to cool. This woman comes across the, and sits down next to me. And, and it's this Mexican woman who's headed back to Mexico because her mom's about to have surgery. And she's a little bit nervous. She said, can I just say hi to your dog? And I said, sure. And so <laughs> she's hanging out with Drake and he's giving her all kinds of love and, effect, and affection. She gets up and this guy comes up, sits down next to me. I had six people in a row come and sit next to me. Every time somebody left, somebody else came and sat and they just all wanted to spend some time with him. And he releases this sort of chemical in us, oxycodone, um, which makes us happier and calmer. And when I take him on flights for most airlines, they are fantastic with him and the people all around are really excited to see him and he's excited to see them. And, you know, we, we were on a flight back from Germany uh, after I taught in Luxembourg. And one of the flight attendants came up and said, can I just say hi? And I said, yeah, he's not working. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> and she goes, it's okay. And there's this line of eight flight attendants <laughs> wanting to come and say hello to him. So he's pretty amazing. Mm. There's something about something about dogs. And uh, we talked a little bit. Um, before we got going here, but I have, I have three of them here and uh, two of them come to, I work at a gym, two of them come to work with me at the gym. Um, my Alaskan Malamute uh, in particular, I can't, can't that, that guy, he's, he's just left. <laughs> okay. um, uh, but he, there's something about him that is very calming for people. And uh, I remember um, last winter I did a teen camp for teens and I don't know if you know like 15 year old you know they they don't know each other they show up and everybody's shy and no one's talking to each other right day two I'm like you know what? I'm gonna bring his name is bear I'm like I'm gonna bring bear made such a difference it's just it one after sure another they were just all giving bear loves he's just he has this way of like looking into your eyes and completely stealing your soul Right, And I brought him every day from there on. And I think anytime someone got anxious, they would just make their way over to bear for some loves and cuddles and then they would feel better. And then, and they would kind of just move on and go do the, the next thing. And there's something about the energy of dogs that, um, or some dogs, not all dogs necessarily, but right. that, um, just yeah. really have that, that power to, to calm you down. And well, and it make, gives people an excuse good. to approach us. Yeah. Right. And so often we're, we're uncertain about how people are going to respond, mm -hmm. what they're going to, what the story they're going to have is right. And, you know, I'm six foot three and, you know, 240 pounds. I'm a fairly big guy. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always conscious of the fact that people may be uncomfortable near me because they don't mm -hmm. know me and they see me acting a little odd right? Cause I can't see anything. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of stumbling and fumbling a little bit or, but now with Drake, they're like, Oh, he's visually impaired. And I mm -hmm. bet I could say hi to his dog. Mm -hmm. and, and his dog <laughs> is staring at everybody going, hi, I'm Drake. And I tell people his name's Drake because he can't sing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we've got this sort of this magnetism from him that brings people in and allows us to connect. Mm -hmm. and it seems to break so many boundaries and it allows us to interact and engage in a way that sometimes we're kind of comfortable with we struggle with well and in just in the terms of trust it makes you 
more automatically makes you more of a trustworthy person because you you have this thing that you care give your care and attention to and right? he's happy and he's happy and he looks you know he's looks well taken care of so there's yeah. just that little added like oh that tr that human is trustworthy because they can care for an animal and keep it <laughs> right. happy and safe <laughs> yeah the the context is is there right mm -hmm. they're like and and i used to ask people you know if, if you had shown Americans a picture of a Muslim after 9-11, what story would they have had? Well, if you'd taken a, a, put a baby in their arms, the story changes, right? If you put them with a guide dog, the story would change again. And, you know, it's, it's how we engage with the world. And a part of the challenge that we're facing right now is the approaches we used to take to building trust aren't strong enough anymore. We need to be more intentional. We need to be more thoughtful than we had to be in the past because the rules, the uncertainties climb so much. And so people see Drake and I, and I, I think director of goodness is such an appropriate title for him because he just brings such warmth and affection to every room I'm in. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it was just a few days ago. I sent Kristen a picture uh, of a dog at the gym. Her name is Tilly. And she was a seeing eye got dog school dropout. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't quite make it and was just the most perfect girl. She was just amazing. And I have no idea why she she didn't uh, quite make it, but but we, we love her at the gym just just yeah. Just well, as much. <laughs> the 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 nice thing about BC Alberta guide dogs now is that they're actually providing PTSD dogs as well. Mm -hmm. And so they're they're dogs who don't make it through the because it's a it's it's a pretty remarkable thing for a dog to make it through that program yeah um you know drake's pretty amazing like we get to the vancouver airport and usually they will have someone come and help guide me mm -hmm. unless it's air canada um <laughs> and then drake's like i'm on it and yeah. he just he gets me to the luggage and gets me through security and gets me, like he he has now figured out the route mm -hmm. and he's just like come on let's go and so he's he's remarkable um and his ability to get us around places is just mm -hmm. it it's a life changer and i have no doubt that that tilly is just a sweetheart because mm -hmm. they do such a good job of breeding and, and caring for them and you know that process of training them it's it's 40 or fifty thousand dollars for a, a seeing eye dog of training mm -hmm. so magic dog we don't deserve them <laughs> <laughs> um awesome uh where can our listeners go to find out more about you and the work that you're doing in your book and everything that's going on so they can come to trust unlimited uh, my website, www.trustunlimited.com. And if they go to the about section, they'll see a picture of Drake, the mm -hmm. director of goodness. Um, there's a, a link to the book, but you can find the book, Building Trust, Exceptional Leadership in an Uncertain World, anywhere you buy books online. Um, it's available as an ebook or an audio book or hardcover. Um, there's also courses on the website that have, uh, you can apply for, it's a master class. It's about three hours in length, series of five minute segments. Um, the cat makes an appearance. <laughs> and my, my email address is Daryl at trustunlimited.com. Perfect timing for the cat. She didn't want to be left out. <laughs> no, this is Clover. Hello, Clover. It's a cameo, a catio. Yeah. <laughs> and be, before we wrap we'd love for you to give our listeners a, a recommendation for how they can start their own pirate life so for me the pirate life is is as you've described breaking the rules for good mm -hmm. um i think if you want to have a positive impact in the world, let's do something novel and actually ask people what good would look like. Mm 
for them. Um, start including other people in the conversation, getting curious about them in, in a way that work on those skills, those questioning skills, those Socratic skills where you, you're asking people questions and to actually paying attention um, to see if there's ways you can be helpful. Great advice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah, Daryl, thank you so much for talking with us today. We really enjoyed the conversation and have lots to apply now too to building trust within our relationships around us. Thanks so much for having me and helping me spread the message. <laughs>